In Psalm chapter 24, we're going to pick it up in verse 1. The Bible says, the earth is the Lord's and everything in it, the world's and all who live in it. For he founded it upon the seas and established it upon the waters. Who may ascend the hill of the Lord? Who may stand in his holy place? He who has clean hands and a pure heart. Who does not lift up his soul to an idol or swear by what is false? He will receive blessings from the Lord and vindication from God, his Savior. Such is the generation of those who seek him, who seek your face, O God of Jacob. You know, it's an amazing psalm of David. And David was passionate about God. And he shows us that we need to be passionate about God today. He starts off and he says, hey, the earth is God's and everything in it. Even us, we are God's. See, the goal is for us to be with God, having a pure heart and clean hands, no idols. But the earth is God's and everything in it. Everything means everything. You know what's amazing? What I realized when I was sitting thinking, I was like, man, we really don't own anything in this life. We just don't. We actually have a rented life. Let me get into more details. Even the cars that we drive is rented. The shoes that we wear is rented. The house that we live in is rented. You say, no, I bought it, bro. No, it's rented, amen? Even our own bodies are rented. You know, what everyone in this world has in common is that there is a 100% chance that you will die. And guess what? You can take nothing with you when you go. So that means that what we have today and even what we had yesterday, it is rented. There's nobody that can take anything with them, whether they're rich or poor in this life. You know, all us disciples can really take after we die is our salvation. That's the only thing we can take when we die. So we got to hold tight to our salvation. Now, I like to describe it as a running back holding the football when he's going through and running. See, our opponent's always trying to hit the ball out of the running back's hands. And today we have Satan that's trying to hit the ball out of our hands. He does not want us to go with salvation. He wants us to go with nothing and go to hell. You know, today we're going to talk about a topic in which I believe is overlooked a lot. The topic we're going to talk about today is entitlement. Hey, everybody, say, suck the air out of the room. Like, ooh, that's like, entitlement, isn't it? So entitlement, what is it? It's the state or belief that one is deserving of privileges or special treatment. You know, think about it. If you're a child and you get everything you want and then you grow up, guess what? You're going to think that, hey, I should get everything I want. And when a child doesn't get everything he wants, he goes bonkers or she goes bonkers, Amen. But entitlement is a mentality rooted in I deserve or I have the right to do and to have whatever I want. And I will punish, resent, or blame anyone or anything that stands in the way of my desires. You know, right now, I'm going to share a movie clip. And I think this movie is pretty awesome. It's called Back to the Future. And uh, for you young people, you, you might not know that. It came out in the 80s, I bet. So, you know, I, <laughs> I was a little young then, too. But that's one of my favorite movies. But Back to the Future illustrates this in the character of Biff Tannen. He was an entitled bully and a nemesis of George McFly. So in this instance, after barring and wrecking George's car, so Biff actually wrecked this guy's car, amen? Biff holds George responsible. (laughs) He wrecked George's car, but he holds George responsible, amen? He blames George for not making him aware that the car had blind spots. So what we're going to do, we're going to watch as Biff talks to George. You know, I don't like bullies, amen, but a grown man being bullied, that's a disgrace. (laughs) But right here, George McFly was being bullied by his nemesis. And Biff was entitled in every single way. So how do you know if you struggle with entitlement? Number one, you have constant expectations. 
And when those expectations are not fulfilled, oh, man, you throw a fit. Number two, there's a lack of gratitude. Number three, frustration with norms. Number four, frequent complaints. Number five, minimal effort, maximum reward. And number six, you got resentment toward authority. You know, the word of God opposes entitlement in every single way. Yeah, uh, yeah, yeah, I'm going to beat those sisters. <laughs> so number one is constant expectations. Number two is the lack of gratitude. Number three is frustration with norms. Number four, frequent complaints. Number five, minimal effort, maximum reward. And number six, Resentment towards authority. So what we need to understand, family, is that the word of God opposes entitlement. See, entitlement is a manifestation of pride, which is often considered one of the gravest sins. Entitlement can lead to selfishness, greed, and a lack of compassion. It can jeopardize our relationship with God and also each other. You know, the Lord created Adam and Eve. And Adam and Eve had one command. And that command was, do not eat from the tree. Then you know the knowledge of good and evil. And that was their Bible at the time. Imagine that was their Bible, just one command. Would you be able to obey that one command? Or would you cross over and not obey it? Let's look at Genesis chapter 3. You know, this is a title that I had to deal with in my own heart. And that's why I'm preaching it today. Amen. So you you preach what you got to deal with uh, on a daily basis. Amen? In Genesis chapter 3. In verse 1. The Bible says, Now the serpent was more crafty than any of the wild animals the Lord God had made. He said to the woman, Did God really say you must not eat from any tree in the garden? The woman said to the serpents, We may eat fruit from the trees in the garden, but God did say you must not eat fruit from the tree that is in the middle of the garden, and you must not touch it or you will die. You will not surely die, the serpent said to the woman, for God knows that when you eat of it, your eyes will be opened and you will be like God, knowing good and evil. When a woman saw that the fruit of the tree was good for food, And pleasing to the eye, and also desirable for gaining wisdom. She took some and ate it. She also gave some to her husband, who was with her, and he ate it. And right here is a crazy story. And the Bible says Satan was crafty. More crafty than any other wild animals that was there. So he comes to this woman, and then he questions the command that was given to this woman. And so she questions the word of God. And we see this is where interpretation started from right here in the very beginning. You know, Satan got Eve to question God's word and use entitlements to deceive her. He said, you know, when a woman saw the tree, it says in verse uh, 4, he says, you will not surely die, the serpent said to the woman. For God knows that when you eat of it, your eyes will be open and you will be like God, knowing good and evil. So in other words, Satan will say, no, look, God is stopping you from a good thing, Eve. That wicked God. How can he stop you from eating from this tree? And also he's saying that you have the right, you deserve it. And when Satan gets into your mind, you're like, yeah, you're right. You know, I know, yeah, I do have the right. And so she went ahead and ate from the tree. And then she gave some to her husband who was right there the whole time. That's convicted for me as a husband. You mean to tell me that Satan was talking to my wife and I said nothing about it? That's crazy, guys. But yeah, when a husband's checked out, that's what happens, amen? Satan gets in there in his wife's mind. You know what's crazy is that entitlement has been around since the beginning of time for men and women. But today, we're going to learn how to deal with entitlement in our hearts 
Because God has a calling for us to make it to heaven. And no one needs to be left behind. We all, as the kingdom of God, need to make it to heaven. And we got to make sure that we're fighting to get there together. Are you guys with me? You know, today we're going to study out Cain and Abel. Cain was the first follower in the Bible. The first follower. And he was entrapped by entitlement. That Abel was the first martyr, but yet he broke free from it because he lived by faith. The title of today's lesson is Breaking the Chains of Entitlements. You know, what's amazing is that we've been set free on a day of our baptism. Our sins have been wiped out clean, our past, present, and future sins. But I think the key that we need to understand is that Satan is there along with us trying to trap us with our sinful natures so that we can be in chain and go nowhere for the sake of God. You know, in Genesis chapter 4, verse 1 to 2, Satan was working even behind the scenes when it came to Cain and Abel. Genesis chapter 4, verse 1. The Bible says, Adam lay with his wife Eve, and she became pregnant and gave birth to Cain. She said, with the help of the Lord, I brought forth a man. Later, she gave birth to his brother, Abel. Now, Abel kept flocks, and Cain worked the soil. You know, what's interesting about this is that Adam and Eve had kids, and their oldest son was Cain. But then after, they birthed Abel, which was a younger brother of Cain. And we all know the story of what happens, and that Cain kills Abel. But I think what we fail to understand is what led up to this murder. Now, right here, the Bible says that Abel kept flocks. So we understand that Abel was a shepherd. He kept the flocks in the field. But yet Cain worked the soil, and he was a farmer. See, they were both workers. But we can say from a worldly perspective that a farmer is a harder work than a shepherd. This is why. You know, the difference between a farmer of crops and being a shepherd is that it's a job where there is always a lot to do. And you have to constantly fight the weeds and the weather. So it's frustrating as it is weather dependent and feelings of it's unfair can come in. Why doesn't God give me a break with the weather? So in Cain's occupation, he was very busy being a farmer. He had to work late nights. He was busy pulling up crops, weeds. And a busy life can push God out of the picture, as opposed to being a shepherd, where there's a lot of time to pray and meditate on God. So Cain being Abel's brother can look at Abel and say, man, you know, you got it better than me, brother. You're the shepherd. And I'm here working hard. And God is putting me through punishments. You know, his brother Abel, had it easier than him from a worldly perspective. You know, for Cain, resentment could have been brewing before it was time to give to God. My question to you, family, is that do you wrestle with where God has you in life right now? You know, when we look at others and compare our lives to others, we can wrestle with that. Or even when it comes to the world and you look at the world, oh, they have it so much easier than what I have in the kingdom of God. See, that's a misunderstanding of who God is. God loves us. He gives us a great life. But we have to see it and take it. Are you guys with me? Now, I remember um, being a uh, young campus student. I was working at uh, the Washington Hospital Center in Washington, D.C. Amen? And the thing about it, I had a very difficult job because I worked night shift. And guess what? Nobody in the D.C. church worked the hours that I worked. So as I worked, everybody was asleep. And when I got off, they were well rested. They were like, ah, man, full of energy. But hearing me, I'm dragging my feet to the means of the body, coming to church, being half asleep. And then all of a sudden, my heart just started getting bitter at the other brothers and sisters. I'm like, man, they don't have to do what I got to do. I work overnight. I work several hours. And then when the brothers and sisters asked me, hey, come on, let's go sharing. I'm tired. I do a lot. Come on. So there was a resentment buildup in my heart. And that's what can happen in our hearts today. 
You know, marriage, when we're going through tough times in our marriages, do you wish, man, the singles got it better than us, man. Man, I used to be up all night playing video games with the brothers. Now I got to be with my wife and talk to her all night. What? Oh, unlucky me, amen? Or what about singles? I'm like, I got to go to sleep by myself every single night. The marriage needs to go with somebody. Look at me. Lonely. I'm Mr. Lonely. Nobody cares. That's how we feel, right? And then the campus is like, man, I got to go to school. I have all this work. Man, my life is harder than everybody. But it's our perspective of what hard is. Point number one, giving God our best in all circumstances. Giving God our best in all circumstances. Let's pick it up in verse 3. The Bible says in verse 3, In the course of time, Cain brought some of the fruits of the soil as an offering to the Lord. But Abel brought fat portions from some of the firstborn of the flock. The Lord looked with favor on Abel and his offering. But on Cain and his offering, he did not look with favor. So Cain was very angry and his face was downcast. Point number one, giving God our best in all circumstances. So the background of this story is very important, guys. Because I believe that's what led up to what they sacrificed to the Lord. You know, Cain and Abel both present offerings to God. Abel's offering, fat portions for some of the firstborn of his flock. Which meaning that he gave the best of the best. And he laid it out for God. So God looked with favor on Abel and his offering. Then God turns to Cain. <laughs> And Cain brought some of the fruits of the soil. And God did not look with favor. But the Bible says Cain was angry and his face was downcast. The question I had and I always had, if they both gave to God, because they both gave, right? It's not like Cain came empty-handed. Why was Cain's sacrifice rejected? Let's look at Hebrews chapter 11. In Hebrews chapter 11. Hebrews chapter 11, verse 4. The Bible says, By faith, Abel offered God a better sacrifice than Cain did. By faith, he was commended as a righteous man when God spoke well of his offerings. And by faith, he still speaks, even though he is dead. Jump over to verse 6. The Bible says, and without faith, it's impossible to please God. Because anyone who comes to him must believe that he exists and that he rewards those who earnestly seek him. Based on verse 6, do we believe that God will reward us? But we also see that Abel gave his best because he operated not in fear, but in faith. He operated in God's love language, faith. And faith and obedience go hand in hand. Are you guys with me? You know, Abel did not value his flock more than God, but gave away his best. He invested his best into a sacrifice, trusting that God can give more back. And he looked to his reward. You know, Cain gave without faith, not in trusting his best to God who rewards those who seek him. Therefore, Cain was disobedient. I think from Hebrews chapter 11, verse 6, I think we forget that without faith, it's impossible to please God. But we also forget that those who seek God with faith, God rewards. We forget the reward part because as we're seeking God, we're giving to God, the reward doesn't come in our timing. And so when the reward doesn't come in our timing, we think it's not coming. And so we get bitter and we get upset. You know, what's interesting about this, Cain, he became angry and downcast because he suffered with entitlement. Giving God our best in all circumstances breaks the chains of entitlement. 
No, we are called to live by faith and not by sight. See, Abel lived by faith, but yet Cain lived by sight. See, our God is above being logical. This is the God of the universe that can do anything just like that with the snap of his fingers. God can do anything with your life. But yet to be your best spiritually, you have to give God your best. You know, what's amazing about Jesus is that Jesus came here with nothing. He had nothing. But yet he was a son of God. He had every right to be entitled. But he gave God his best. And I want to read a story about Jesus and giving God his best. You know, in a humble carpenter's workshop in Nazareth, Jesus worked diligently, shaping wood with care and precision. His hands, skilled from years of labor, created items both simple and beautiful. Despite his humble occupation, Jesus always gave his best, knowing that every task, no matter how small, was an opportunity to honor God. One day, as Jesus finished crafting a sturdy wooden table, he paused to reflect on a growing sense of purpose within him. He knew that soon his work would transcend the physical and enter the spiritual realm. He felt called to something greater, to bring God's message of love, hope, and redemption to the world. After leaving his workshop, Jesus journeyed to the Jordan River, where he was baptized by John the Baptist as he emerged from the water. The heavens opened and God's voice proclaimed, this is my beloved son in whom I am well pleased. Jesus knew that this was the beginning of his divine mission. In the Garden of Gethsemane, on the night before his crucifixion, Jesus prayed fervently, his heart heavy with the knowledge of suffering that awaited him. Father, if you are willing, Take this cup from me, yet not my will, but yours be done, he said. His sweat was like drops of blood falling to the ground. Despite his anguish, Jesus resolute in giving his all for God's plan. The next day, Jesus carried his cross to Golgotha and was crucified. In his final moments, he uttered, Father, into your hands I commit my spirits. With his last breath, Jesus completed his ultimate act of love and obedience, offering his life for the salvation of humanity. Through his sacrifice, Jesus gave his best for God, fulfilling the divine mission and opening the path to eternal life for all who believe. His life and death remain the greatest testament to the power of giving one's best to God. Can you believe that? Our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ, was the first one to give God his very best when he was on this earth. Now, how do you know when you're giving your best, when you have nothing left? That's how you know. Giving your all. Now, every person carries a talent. Every person has a heart. Every person has something they have towards God that can give to God's kingdom. And God's kingdom can propel. You know, in our singing, worship, are we giving our full hearts to singing? Do you know Jesus sang with all of his heart? We got to give our full hearts in that. What about studying God's word? Are we wrestling with the scriptures day in and day out? You know, it's amazing. I had an um, awesome conversation with Joshua today. And Joshua, yeah, he's, he's very pure-hearted, amen? I, I love the brother, you know? Uh, but Joshua has a conviction on the word of God. So much so that he fights to seek the word of God so that his character and his life can change. And that's how we need to depend on the word of God on a day in and day out basis. So I can say the same thing about my awesome brother Damien as well too. He goes after the word of God and he fights to wrestle with his character. Now in our prayer life, are we giving our all to God? You know, in the first century, James, he was called camel knees. Why? Because his knees were so hard because all he was, he was on his knees praying to God. So they called him Camel Knees. He was noted for his prayer life. That's the type of prayer that we need to have. How about in teaching the gospel, preaching the word and hard work? You know, it's amazing to see Dalvin and Emily's Bible talk with Brock and his wife Jasmine going after him, preaching the word of God and God blessing it in many ways. What about in our giving to God? You know, with giving, it comes out of gratitude. 
So when we give, even on Sundays, it's all about God. You know, family, as an Orlando family thing that we need to talk about is that 37 people are not given on a weekly basis here in Orlando. 37 disciples are not given on a weekly basis. So I, I look at that, I'm like, man, it's not about the money. It's about the heart. There's just something wrong if disciples are not giving to God. Even if you don't have much, it's about giving God your best. It's not about the amount. It's about giving God something your best. Are you guys with me? No, the poor widow had two very small copper coins. And Jesus commended her because she gave her best. You know, Cain was greedy. He didn't trust God in his life. But if he would have thought about the power of God, he could have understood that how God can work powerfully in his life. You know, the ultimate measure of a man or woman is not where he or she stands in a moment of com comfort and convenience, but where he or she stands at the times of challenge and controversy. Now I realize when I give my best in everything that I do, it glorifies God. You give your best to your job, it glorifies God. You give your best to sharing your faith, it glorifies God. You give your best to school, it glorifies God. Everything that we do, it will glorify God in every single way. We got to focus on giving our best to God in all circumstances. Amen? Amen. Point number two, taking personal responsibility. Let's look back at Genesis chapter 4. You know, at this point, we see that Cain was angry and his face was downcast. In Genesis chapter 4, verse 6, the Bible says in verse 6, Then the Lord said to Cain, Why are you angry? Why is your face downcast? If you do what is right, will you not be accepted? But if you do not do what is right, sin is crouching at your door. It desires to have you, but you must master it. Point number two, taking personal responsibility breaks the chains of entitlement. See, God confronts Cain. So what's crazy about God is that God noticed that Cain was angry and downcast. And God actually cared for his son. So when we are angry and downcast, God actually comforts us and comes to us because he cares about us. He cares that when we're sad. He cares when we're down. God is there, right there to us when we're feeling many different things. But God confronts Cain about his anger and warns him that sin is crouching at his door, desiring to have him, but he must rule over it. See, instead of taking responsibility for his actions and improving his offering, Cain lets entitlement and jealousy fester. See, entitlement blinds us to our shortcomings and the need for personal growth. It causes us to blame others or circumstances for our failures instead of taking responsibility and making necessary changes. See, with taking personal responsibility, we can actually learn from our mistakes. Yeah. Now, I shared about this many different times, but when I came out of Houston and came out of the ministry, we had a tough time in Houston um, around 2017-18. And when I came out of the ministry, I was bitter. I was bitter at this brother, that brother. I was so upset because I felt like it was wrong. Why would you take me out of the ministry? I felt like I didn't do anything. I'm totally innocent. But I remember just sitting one day in my room and just thinking, it's like, man, I forgot what is God trying to teach me in this situation? Because either God allows it to happen or makes it happen. So everything that happens to us in our lives, God is sovereign in every single way. Yeah. And there's something that we can learn from every single situation. Yeah. Every job I was fired from, not many, amen, I didn't think about it. <laughs> I had to learn. I had to learn. Hey, what, what, what could I have done better? Yeah. See, this helps us take personal responsibility so that we can grow and be at a different level. How can you grow from this? 
You know, in all my conflicts, what can I learn? See, God is the master teacher. He's the master at teaching. Now, we might have disciples, but God is the best disciple you can have. He disciplines us for our own good so that we may share in his holiness. But yet, entitlement creates stagnation in our walk with God. Do you feel angry and downcast today, family? You got to pinpoint why. You got to figure out, hey, what led you to this state? of being angry and downcast? What do you think led to that state of you being angry and downcast? And you be open about it. James chapter 5, verse 16. It says, confess your sins to each other so that you can get the help that you need, amen? But yet Cain was not open, and he kept it to himself. You know, sin is crouching at our doors. It desires to have us. But I think the good news is that we can master sin through the power of God. See, God believed Cain can master it. He says, hey, sin is crouching at your door. Master it. You can defeat sin, especially with the Holy Spirit inside of you. You can master it in every given way. Take responsibility in going back to God. You know, I remember this uh, brother, and this brother was struggling with several different sins. But one in particular, um, he was just dealing with it day after day. It was a struggle. A lot of times he would just, man, he would just confess, like, oh, God, guys, I'm struggling with this different sin. What, what should I do? And the sin has something to do with his computer. But one day the brother was like, no, enough is enough. I've done this enough. He picked up his computer. He smashed it on the ground. Now, obviously he was a disciple for his fit of rage. <laughs> but yeah, he had a conviction about, hey, I'm not going to give him this sin no more. It's about the heart. He was done with it. And he wanted to grow and learn. And for us, we need a fight to grow and learn because God does not want you to be in a place that you're at right now forever. He wants you to become more and more spiritual as the days go by. Amen? Awesome. Point number three, and I'll find a point. Be your brothers and sisters. Keeper. Genesis chapter 4, verse 8. So, of course, God gave Cain a little bit of discipling. Let's see what Cain does with the discipling. Amen? Verse 8. The Bible says, Now Cain said to his brother Abel, Let's go out to the fields. And while they were in the field, Cain attacked his brother Abel and killed him. Then the Lord said to Cain, Where is your brother Abel? I don't know, he replied. Am I my brother's keeper? The Lord said, What have you done? Listen. Your brother's blood cries out to me from the ground. Now you are under a curse and driven from the ground, which opened its mouth to receive your brother's blood from your hand. When you work the ground, it will no longer yield its crops for you. You will be a restless wanderer on the earth. Cain said to the Lord, my punishment is more than I can bear. Today you are driving me from the land and I will be hidden from your presence. I'll be a restless wanderer on the earth, and whoever finds me will kill me. But the Lord said to him, not so. If anyone kills Cain, he will suffer vengeance seven times over. Then the Lord put a mark on Cain's soul that no one who found him will kill him. So Cain went out from the Lord's presence and lived in the land of Nod, east of Eden. Point number three. Be your brothers and sisters keeper. You know, Cain's entitlement and unresolved anger led him to murder his brother, Abel. He was unresolved. And when you're unresolved, it starts right here in the hearts. You're dealing with it on a daily basis. Man, you can't even go to sleep. This, I, I, this guy was up all night. Oh, 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 oh I can't believe what God said to me. Uh, he, he was, he's unresolved. You know, some of us have to fight unresolved anger from the past and for, from what was done to you in the past as well, too. It could be by another brother. It could be by another sister. But we have to be resolved and fight to say God allowed it to happen and what does he want me to learn from the situation? You know, God asked Cain where Abel is. And Abel, a, a, Cain was like, am I my brother's kid? I don't know. I, I don't know. But his response shows a complete lack of responsibility and concern for his brother. 
And then God dealt with Cain for murdering his brother. You will be a restless wanderer on the earth. He was driven away and fell away, and he was no longer in the presence of God. See, God has a power to deal with those who sin against you. He has that power, and he deals. Amen? But let's see something interesting about Abel. Look at Luke chapter 11, verse 50. Luke chapter 11, verse 50. This is something that's very interesting about Abel that blew me away. Because for me, it was kind of weird that Cain just killed his little brother. I mean, that's just weird to me. But why? Luke chapter 11, verse 50. The Bible says, therefore, this generation will be held responsible for the blood of all the prophets that has been shed since the beginning of the world. From the blood of Abel to the blood of Zechariah, who was killed between the altar and the sanctuary. Yes, I tell you, this generation will be held responsible for it all. You know, what's amazing is that Jesus says that Abel was a prophet. And prophets speak the word of God. Most likely, Abel had to say something to his brother that moved Cain even more to kill Abel because Abel was speaking the truth to his brother Cain to correct him. And of course, Cain was not having that. Amen? Abel was his brother's keeper. You know, we must care about how each other is doing spiritually. Either they're in your Bible talk or not. We got to care how about each, how each and every one is doing spiritually. All for one and one for all. It's the kingdom of God. We are in this together, discipling. You know, if a, one brother or sister is faltering, we must speak with the word of God to help them. But for those who are being disciples, how do you respond to discipling? See, if we don't view it from God, we'll be like Cain. Oh, you told me I need to grow up and change? Okay. What's the scripture? Okay, let me take that. I'll sit on it for a day. Ah, come with a knife. Ah, it's like, kill your brother. Ah. It's like, it's like, it's like, it's like, like, ah, yeah. But we need to take discipling, and we need to give discipling as well. And this is not a control thing. This is to help your brother out then, amen? <laughs> to get to heaven. Are you guys with me? You notice any impurity in the church? You speak about it. You speak up. You notice any coarse joking? You speak up. You notice even a hint of impurity? You speak up. Any pride, envy? We got to talk about it with our brother. Because you got to care about their souls. Will you speak up? We all need discipling. Because we all need to go to heaven. Amen. Look at 1 John chapter 3. And 1 John chapter 3 verse 11. The Bible says 1 John chapter 3 verse 11. This is the message you heard from the beginning. We should love one another. Do not be like Cain, who belonged to the evil one and murdered his brother. And why did he murder him? Because his own actions were evil and his brothers were righteous. Do not be surprised, my brothers, if the world hates you. We know that we have passed from death to life because we love our brothers. Anyone who does not love remains in death. Anyone who hates his brother is a murderer. And you know that no murderer has eternal life in him. This is how we know what love is. Jesus Christ laid down his life for us. And we ought to lay down our lives for our brothers. If anyone has material possessions and sees his brother in need, but has no pity on him, how can the love of God be in him? Dear children, let us not love with words or tongue, but with actions. And in truth, the Bible clearly says that love is the key to take care of one another. It says, do not be like Cain who murdered his brother. 
See, loving each other breaks the chains of entitlements. Because the love you have to give. And Jesus Christ was all about giving. See, laying down our lives for each other means everything. See, Cain had an opportunity to repent and be with God once again. But he chose that route. We have a choice today as well too, family. And I know we're going to fight to choose to do what is right in the eyes of God ourselves. Amen. Amen. You know, this is a great time in our church as the spirit will move powerfully. Moves powerfully. And as I'm leaving, of course, you know, Caleb is going to, uh, you'll be leading. But, of course, Jesus leads the church. Amen? Amen. And Jesus does what he wants to do. Amen? Are you guys with me? <laughs> but my wife and I will be gone for 10 days. And I believe right now for the Orlando church, it's time to get our spiritual momentum back in the church. Now, at one point, we've seen the conversion every single week. And it's not about the numbers. It's about us and investing in the lost and making sure and preaching the word to the lost at all costs so that they can be saved. Are you guys with me? So I'm not worried. It's going to be awesome. We're just going to preach the word with all the hearts and we're going to see what God does. We're going to lay down our lives for the mission. You know, let's focus on Christ who had every reason to be entitled on this earth but wasn't. Let's close out Philippians chapter 2, verse 1. Philippians chapter 2, verse 1. The Bible says in Philippians chapter 2, verse 1. If you have any encouragement from being united with Christ, if any comfort from his love, if any fellowship with the Spirit, if any tenderness and compassion, then make my joy complete by being like-minded. Having the same love, being one in spirit and purpose. Do nothing out of selfish ambition or vain conceit, but in humility, consider others better than yourselves. Each of you should look not only to your own interests, but also to the interests of others. Your attitude should be the same as that of Christ Jesus, who being in very nature God, did not consider equality with God something to be grasped, but made himself nothing, taking the very nature of his servant, being made in human likeness, and being found in appearance as a man, he humbled himself and became obedient to death, even death on a cross. Therefore God exalted him to the highest place and gave him the name that is above every name, that at the name of Jesus every knee shall bow in heaven and on earth and under the earth, and every tongue confess that Jesus Christ is Lord to the glory of God the Father. Jesus had every reason to be entitled as he walked this earth. But the Bible says he made himself nothing. Imagine you've had many powers, but you belittled yourself and made yourself nothing so you can win over the world. You know, becoming nothing equals everything. We need to make ourselves nothing. Jesus gave up his rights so that we can be right. That's the heart of Christ. You know, with us, family, I believe God has great plans for us. And I know God's going to do incredible things amongst us. But we have to constantly break the chains and fight against what's called entitlements. And I believe we're all going to be in heaven rejoicing because God is on our side. Love you guys. Breaking the chains of entitlement.